I'm Ralph Jackadine. I'm in the music business management department at Berklee College of Music here in Boston, where we're having a nor'easter. So the fact that I don't have 80 to 90 students wearing masks going into campus and commuting is, is wonderful because they're uh, probably in their PJs at home right now. But Berkeley has about 6,700 students. We have uh, from 100 countries. So about 40 to 45% of our student body is international. And uh, the students are some of the most talented musicians and composers, music therapists, future a and people and managers, tech entrepreneurs, every color, every creed. And Berkeley has campuses and institutes and programs all around the world and in a lot of the neighborhoods here in America. In November of last summer, Noel Skaggs, the lead singer of Fits in the Tantrums and the founder of Diversify the Stage, uh, was part of a panel we had at Berkeley. And it was just an amazing panel about careers in music and how to get jobs, and how to get mentors and things. And it was so successful that I asked her back this fall. And the idea was while Fitz and the Tantrum was making their way around the country, on a day off, she would come to the Berkeley campus and, and talk to my students. So that was the idea. And then it grew when the, uh, the Academy of Country Music down in Nashville got involved. And that kind of broadened things. And, um, and then we got a sponsor of Korg. And that kind of morphed into a world-class uh, panel, which we're, gonna, uh, we're hosting today for you. So we're very excited about this. And um, the first of all, the stage and Korg um, are going to be announcing something that's really exciting. And it's for students looking to break into live entertainment and production careers. And they have, uh, they're going to be announcing an annual scholarship fund. And it's available for students that meet a certain criteria in 2022, which is less than three months away. So there's going to be a pile of money for students that want to get into the business. And um, that information will follow shortly. Um, but now I would like to give a quick message to our sponsor, Korg. Welcome, Korg. Korg is excited and proud to partner with Diversify the Stage. As an employee of Korg and as a member of our social justice committee, teaming with Diversify the Stage puts the future of the music industry in the right place, no matter where they come from or their socioeconomic status. Our goal in teaming with Diversify the Stage is to invest in you, the next generation. We value your ambitions and want to encourage and help you find and take advantage of new opportunities. Korg has always been heavily involved in up-and-coming artists, as well as music education in a classroom setting. Our goal is new music always, and we stand by that with innovative technology brands that give artists, hobbyists, students, and beyond the tools they need to see their creative vision come to life. We're excited to sponsor today's event so you can learn from those already in the field how they got there, how they have grown in their career, and the power of networking in the music industry. Thank you, Cord, And uh, thanks again to the Academy of Country Music and Diversify the Stage. We're really excited. Uh, Berkeley's excited to host this, this panel. And, um, and our, our students are, are really going to benefit from this. So thank you for all the people involved. Um, our moderator today is, is Nada, and she's a force. She's, um, she's had a, she's young, but she's had a long career. And um, she's a mentor at Diversify the Stage for the cohorts. She's one of the top music industry players in Nashville, where she's at this morning. And uh, she was in the Bobby Bone Show, massive syndicated radio show. And then she started a company called Good Cop, Bad Cop. And um, they help, it's, it's an artist development company that helps artists and brands um, kind of break through and dif differentiate themselves um, in the market. So, um, but, I'm really excited that she's running Apple Music's country music chart show. And um, we're really happy to have Nada. She's respected by many. She's a force, as I said, and she's our moderator. Nada, welcome to the screen. <laughs> of course I'm muted. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's been what a year and a half and I still can't get it right. I just learned that there were filters on zoom. I had no idea. 
and I probably could use one, but um, thank you for the kind, kind, kind words. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of this. I've done a few of these with Noelle. She's one of my like closest, bestest friends, and I love what she's doing with Diversify the Stage. And I love the panel that we have today. I mean, we have some incredible people, including two of my favorite women in Nashville, um, Ali Harnell, who is the president Chief Strategy Officer of Live Nation Women, part of, of course, Live Nation. She spent 15 years prior to that at AEG. Um, we've got Becky Garden Heyer, who is the partner and co-head of WME's Nashville office. And I mean, just if you want to talk about a force and a woman who's running things in Nashville, yeah. Um, we've also got Brandon Blackwell, who's a front of house engineer for, you know, some casual names like Nicki Minaj, Lizzo, ASAP Rocky. He's got a bachelor's degree in show production and touring. Um, and we've actually got a former DTS cohort, Carmen Walker, who is now in the music industry, which I love. She got a degree at Loyola in recording arts and a minor in African-American studies. So we've got quite the uh, panel today, which I'm really excited to be a part of. Um, I think, you know, I was reading some of the questions we got from some of the students and I was thinking about how difficult it was for us in the music industry. Sorry, there's like sun coming in right now. Um, for everyone in the music industry that had a job and maybe either lost it or it was put on hold and how difficult that was. But then I was thinking, imagine being a college student and like the entire world stopping. You're probably in your career, you know, in school, getting your degree in the music industry. And all of a sudden it's like completely stopped. So I feel like everyone in the past year and a half pulled a Ross from friends and pivoted. But I think it's really important to like maybe start off in that space and kind of talk about how each of us have used this time to pivot and learn what we needed to do to kind of adjust in our industries. How do you want to start it? Just whoever? Yeah, you, you can start. Um, that's a really good question because I think to your point, it, it there were so many different layers of pivoting. Um, and I know we're all tired of some of those words that got overused and the new normal and, you know, all the stuff that all the words that got overused during um, this time frame. But I'll say we're I'm in an agency. And so obviously live music stopped. We were dealing with how do you postpone tours? How do you reschedule tours? How do you you know, it, it, that was that was a lot of the work and people thought, oh, you aren't busy. I'm like, no, no, we're very busy. And then you know, working alongside partners like Ali and other promoters who, you know, there's there's new rules and regulations and mandates and COVID procedures and legal, you know, clauses that are now in all of our paperwork and all of our contracts going forward. And, but that was a, a, a big part of all of us coming together to make sure that made sense for the business, right? And when I say the business, that includes the buyers, the clients, you know, the crew, you know, you're trying to keep everyone safe. You're trying to keep the audience safe. Um, but yeah, we, you know, when you talk about people losing jobs, we certainly had a downsize and had to furlough and let some people go. And that was really, really tough. Um, and then eventually, you know, we're bringing there. I know there's questions later on about, you know, who's hiring. We're hiring again. So that's the good news. Um, but I think it gave us a good lens to look at like, okay, well, what were we doing right or wrong before what do we need improvement on and that's something that like you always need to be doing as a business but this certainly has caused us to be even more um, reflective on that and really intentional about how are we changing our practices and how are we thinking um, about navigating this moving forward because it's you know it's still a it's still an evolving virus as we know and it's still a changing process as to how to keep getting better at this business long answer pass the baton to someone else. <laughs> Brandon, I, I read that you, um, this is really interesting. So you went to Full Sail. I grew up in Orlando, so I went to sure. UCLA, so shout out. But um, <laughs> I was reading that you not only are writing a children's book or maybe have written it, but during COVID, you also took your hobby of gaming and kind of like 
evolved that, which I thought was really interesting taking that idea of like, okay, there are gamers everywhere, but I'm going to use that as a touring, you know, professional and kind of, so can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, top of the pandemic, um, as Becky said, you know, the, the music industry and I, as, as what I would say, a boots on the ground person as a crew member, it ended immediately. Um, I'd flown, I had traveled January through February in Australia and all over, and you hear about this, uh, this virus, but you know, you're not thinking, I wasn't thinking much of it. So um, I'll say definitely blessed <clears throat> to not have caught it in those travels during that period. But um, in the beginning of the pandemic, it was just, you know, finding things to pass time because on tour, the day is different every single day. It's a different city. Um, you're meeting different people. And I need, for me personally, I need interaction. Um, I love my fiance Ariel to death, but when it's just us two together and it was, and, and, I, and we had just gotten engaged March 13th. And then I don't know if you remember the timing, the 14th is when the world really shut down. Um, that was the most time we had ever spent together. This, this period that we're still in right now. Um, and I just needed more, more, more and more interactions with people. I, did, I didn't care who it was. And, and video games was something that I did in college. Um, I guess I was kind of successful. I don't think I was, but um, it, it was just something that I needed to pass time. It, it, it then turned into me learning how to trade stocks and day trade, which was, um, that was another shift during the pandemic that I was like, you know, maybe I don't need to come back to touring. Because, it, it, you know, after a couple of months, it got really, really, um, and this is me being vulnerable, but it got really, really dark because you're, you're hearing the back and forth of just, hey, we're coming back. We're not coming back. What do you do? And for me, um, the first early, the cu first couple early months, I got my hopes up. Like, you know, we're coming back in July. You know, July is now September. You know what I mean? And for me, it was just time to really just focus on my mental um, I spent about 90% of my year on the road and never had time for therapy. I, you know, I haven't been to a therapist prior to the pandemic ever, really. And um, during this pandemic, I just, you know, I took it upon myself to really focus in on my mental um, thoughts and, and, and just being a, a, a better rounded Brandon Blackwell. You know, I'm good at sound, but how's my mental before that? And, and um, I'm truly blessed to have been able to really focus in on mental stability and, you know, especially just for touring people. I, I, I'm a huge advocate of it and I push it uh, probably more than I should, but I think people just need it, you know, more in their life, especially now um, with what we're dealing with. Another long answer, I guess. <laughs> hey, it's okay. We have time. <laughs> I, I think it's such a great point that Brandon makes. <clears throat> um, it, it, you know, I think we're all still in it. And for students, I, uh, I said before the webinar began, I have a college age student who's pursuing a, a career in, in music as well. And so it, I, I felt all of the things for the last year and a half. I felt it as an executive in the music business, in the live music business that literally just stopped on a dime and was gone. And and teams furloughed and people let go and, and our own, um, you know, uh, access to our livelihood was very compromised. And it was, there was so much uncertainty. So as an executive, I was feeling it, but as a mother too, my kid had to come home from school, uh, got totally screwed out of his college experience, continues to be screwed out of his, what he worked his butt off, you know, to, to get into the college he wanted to go to and to get, have that four years. And it's been a really hard time. Um, and it can't be uh, overstated or, or underestimated. So what Brandon's, what Brandon's saying and centering, I think is the most important thing to talk to about um, students, young people who aspire to have a career in this music business, you know, it it mandates that we have resiliency and it and it mandates that we take care of our mental health um before covid but certainly after covid it is it is paramount so it is like the biggest thing that we could impart to to the students on this webinar right now is figure out your toolbox figure out your toolbox for mental health as brandon said if it's a therapist if it's yoga and meditation if it's long walks in nature if it's journaling 
if it's community, you know, um, friends, you know, get get solid with that stuff because it's going to carry you through. This is a uh, it's a tough business. It's a tough business for an artist and it's a tough business for an executive but it's also an amazing business. And if you believe in the abundant creative energy of the universe and that you can tap into that flow and be on the journey of it instead of when am I winning my Grammy or when am I going to be front of house engineer for Nicki Minaj, but be on the journey of it, um, you could, you know, you can do it and you can have a good time doing it and make a living doing it and, and have a good life. That was a long answer. Sorry. No, I love that answer, Ali. And speaking about the journey, I think it's interesting coming from this time and graduating um, or being in college and figuring out your next steps. It's a very particular experience and trying to navigate it, I think, is our strong suit. You know, I graduated in 2020, so it was funny. I had to be re relocated um, from where I was going to school in LA, studying audio engineering, interning for Sony. I was like, oh, this is great, right? And then I had to pick up everything, like you said, March 13th, right? And go back home. And I had to finish out audio finals from my computer at home. Like, <laughs> imagine how bad that sounds, right? First we go to the studio and then having to finish it at home. Like, that was terrible. But, you know, they were, real, they were really leaning in on us. Um, but I was blessed to figure out ways to be flexible during this time and have been blessed to have started two amazing um, positions within this time and I'm now working for RCA Inspiration. And what I will say is the positive thing about now is that we can become flexible, right? The industry is no longer bound to geography. The reason why I moved from Memphis, Tennessee to LA is because, you know, I wanted a fair shot and my parents were able to give me that fair shot to move and study music and to intern and to, you know, be on film sets, to, to be in the studio. But now, you know, we're able to, if you're in Cincinnati, you can apply, you know, to Miami, you can apply to Atlanta and, you know, there's full-time remote positions opening up. And even now with me being still based in LA, taking a job that's based in Nashville, shout out Becky and Allie, <laughs> I'll be moving in the new year, um, you know, being able to, to work for Sony in Nashville. So I'm, I'm so blessed to have not um, just kind of counted myself out too early. You guys can do it put yourselves out there. Um, and if you start weighing your options in new ways, you'll be surprised at what your journey will look like. That's a great point. I think, you know, um, I graduated quite a long time ago, but I feel like when I was in school and maybe this is a similar situation, but I went to school for journalism, the newspaper reporting track. And it was like back in like, I graduated in 08 and I remember thinking newspapers were kind of declining at that point and I had to pivot and I had to realize like okay I have other skill sets and digital and whatever and how can I use that to then create a career and I think your point Carmen is exceptional it's like you got to look at you know and I think a lot of times people in the creative spaces unfortunately don't realize that there are jobs like Ali said like there are jobs in this creative space and you can make an amazing living out of it but I'm curious Carmen since you're you know like freshly graduated you were in the DTS program and you kind of went through what we were talking about how as a student you know, and someone who was graduating, what were your biggest challenges and what was something that you were kind of, um, you know, worried about or what kind of things were you, you know, stressed about coming out of college and going into a career in music? Yeah, um, so many things. But I think the main thing was the idea of being pigeonholed to the first um, role that I was able to take, right? Because I was just so excited to, to just start working. I knew what I wanted to do, but then I understood that some of the roles I was interested in, I just was not seeing. So I was like, well, I want to start, but you know, some people that have been seasoned in the industry, you know, they they give you advice to specialize um, and to, to get in where, where you'd love to be in and start learning, getting as much, you know, experience as possible. But during COVID, especially for AR positions, it was just not there, right? <laughs> you know, there at the, at the same time that, you know, money was falling within the music industry, people were trying to figure it out. So the last thing they were trying to do was, you know, make their, their rosters bigger, you know, or bring more people onto the team when they're trying to figure out things budget wise. And we can't send our artists on touring and they, and teams have to downsize. So I had to think of ways to 
connects what I wanted to do moving forward with what I could land now and sell myself in that way to, hey, um, this is what I'm interested in. Um, and this is what I would, I would love to do. And it tells this story of where I'd like to go and you're a part of it. And that's okay. You don't have to feel bad about um, starting in something that is not your passion. Everything's connected. You're gonna meet people along the way. You're gonna learn about this piece of the business that you think is not important to your side of things, but it is. There's always a, a document. There's always an agreement for every side of this thing. And there's something that you're gonna learn about it within that position that you're starting in. So my encouragement would just be to, to just start, get busy. If you can't find a role or an internship, volunteer, um, you know, be an apprentice, you know, just find ways to, to get involved. And then you're gonna be able to use those experiences in that story um, for your first role that is going to happen. Also, I have this message on my computer that says it's going to restart in 60 minutes. I don't know if that's actually going to happen, um, but <laughs> if it does, I will hop back on. <laughs> If you have a Mac, you can like turn that off. <laughs> I think um, I do. I think you know that's a great segue into like a big piece of what I want to talk about today, which is networking in the music industry. Because I think somehow when I was in college, I realized interning and networking were like the two biggest things that I could do, and that's all I did. And I don't know why that came into my mind, but I still see it to this day. Like when I left my job in radio and started a company, had I not built the network that I had over, you know, 10 plus years, I would not have had a successful company. And I think, you know, I feel like if I were a student right now, I would be scared because you can't network. And, and even as a business owner and as someone who's in the music industry currently, I remember thinking, you know, I'm not good on Zoom. Like I need to be in the room. I need to be with people. I feel like a lot of people feel that way. And so my question is, is what can we tell these students in terms of how can they network now? How can they do what Carmen was saying without being in person? Like what are some of the tips and tricks that you guys are seeing now in your industries and in your, in your companies? And, and what can we tell these um, students watching? It's a really good point because I haven't left my house in 18 months. So unless you're coming to my backyard to hang out with my chickens, uh, you're not seeing me out and about. Um, I almost want to like pivot and I, I didn't understand the Ross um, from Friends thing. I, I guess I'm culturally moronic. I know. Just don't judge Holly, me. It's like the best what? episode ever. Gosh. I just, I, I was very busy with my career and raising children. I wasn't watching Friends. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I'll go back. I'll try and I it. reference friends and everything. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hilarious. Anyway, I, I want to pivot though, because don't we feel like talking about how to do it now? Aren't, aren't we pivoting from lockdown to the world is starting to open up? So how do you seize that more than how do you do it on zoom when the world is shut down? Am I, or am I missing, am I missing something? I think it's, I think, you know, and, and, please Brandon or Becky or Carmen jump in, but I feel like, you know, there's a balance, right? Cause Becky kind of mentioned it earlier. We're not out of COVID. So like, there are some people who haven't left their homes. There are yeah. some people who are out and about. And I think maybe you're right. Like we should, how do we do it now moving out of COVID and how do we do it while we're still kind of in it? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I would point to, I would definitely point to all of the, you know, um, she is the music, diversify the stage, she said so. There are so many organizations that are creating community and then opportunity through mentorship, sponsorship, you know, apprenticeship, et cetera. Um, and I would be super aggressive with that, you know, for the students here who are trying to um, have a career as a music business person, I think most of you are musicians primarily. And so I would say if you are um, if you are hopeful to be a music cr creator in your life as a vocation, um, it is more important than ever to learn and understand the business of the music you're creating. And the world has shifted. I I've been in the business 30 years. Every morning I wake up, I have five music letters I read, uh, you know, newsletters I read, and it is most of it's over my head. It won't be over your head because it's of your generation. But so much of it is, um, I'm like, oh my God, that's not how we did it. 
Um, but but tapping into how to protect yourself, you know, get, get uh, your 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 music business toolbox. I guess you're gonna have your mental health toolbox, and you're gonna have your music business, right? What do I need to do to um, protect my copyrights? To make sure I'm getting all my income streams from Sound Exchange and the PROs, etc. Like learning that stuff. Do not count on a business manager, a lawyer, a manager, whatever. Be in charge of your business. Run your shit. And you can be educating yourself. It's called Google. It's a computer. You're, you're at one of the best schools in the country, in the world to learn that stuff. But there, is, there are so many resources for you to be learning right now so that when you are coming to market, you are, you're armed with the tools. And then for the networking part, to, to Nada's point, I literally say this all the time to anybody who'll listen to me. Your network, your Rolodex, for you young people, a Rolodex was a thing that like spun and it was a card and it said, Ralph, Berkeley, 617-555. And now it's your contact thing in your iPhone. But that is the most valuable resource in your life. Uh, and again, I'm talking to you the way I talk to my kid, my 21-year-old. Every single person you meet, you got to figure out how to impress them. You got to figure out how to show up and over deliver and over perform. And I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. You want to stand out? There's 8 billion people on the planet. Figure out how to stand out. Know your shit. Do, you know, work, work hard, get your toolboxes going. And I would say like in terms of networking, social media, these, you know, these groups, the She Is The Music, Diversify The Stage, uh, Black Music Artists Coalition, you know, there's, there are plenty and Diversify The Stage has a ton of resources that you can go and, and look to and become a part of these communities and show up and DM. I get a million LinkedIn, whatever. I can't respond to everyone. I have guilt about it every day, but sometimes I do. Sometimes I have this 30 minute window where I'm like doing something and I'm like, the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, divine intervention said, Allie, reach back out to that person. And now I've created a relationship. Have a thick skin because the executives don't have time to answer everybody that's knocking on their door. You're not always going to get a response, but every now and then magic happens. So I'd say put yourself out there. Long answer. Peace out. I would also myself. say, I mean, to Allie's point, but think about in your peer groups, because I think a lot of people think, oh, I need to reach out to some senior level executive, but there's a lot of peer group communities that are just as important. I, the, my longest lasting relationships are the people I met when I was an assistant or a support level, and we've all grown together in the business. And that's like, that's the best part about this business, whether you're in a band with someone or you're, like I said, in the support, you know, junior role at a company or whatever, interning together, and then you both grow like like those are relationships that are so valuable. So don't just think like, oh, I'm intimidated to email so-and-so because I'm doing research or I'm asking questions. Well, think about your, you know, someone who's literally going through it with you because there's a lot of, a lot of knowledge and resources in those types of relationships as well. Solid, um, WMBA, Source, those are Nashville-based um, community groups, but I know they exist in LA and in, in New York and other, you know, uh, really everywhere. And to Carmen's point, there's so many virtual meetings that those groups are having. You can do it from wherever you are. You know, you just got to find out how you can, whether if you get invited to an, an event or a webinar or a panel, or you can meet someone via social media and just start to connect with them. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, Becky. I mean, I think most of your time networking should be horizontally as opposed to vertically, because the reality is like Ali was saying, most folks that are busy have these projects like once you get to that space, you will see and be like, oh my God, I see why these people didn't respond to me. They are busy 24 seven. So I think when you do get a hold of someone, okay, how to network, it needs to be strategic. It needs to be concise. If you're going to go the DM route and this person does not know you, you need to have a very short pitch about what it is that you need to ask from them. Um, a short, I mean, a short spiel of who you are. You know, I have time, right? Because I'm, I'm newer to the business and I, 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 have, I have a passion about this. Everyone is not passionate about it just because they're in the industry. That's not the case. Not everyone that you reach out to is going to respond. And I mean, at the end of the day, even though we are students, no one's obligated to give you their time. So you have to think about it that way and say, okay, how am I going to connect particularly to this person? 
Have you read their bio? Do you even know what their company does? It's funny. I get a lot of people reach out to me, you know, that there are musicians that sending me music, but haven't looked up and saw that RCA Inspiration is a gospel label and they're sending me R&B hip hop music. That tells me they didn't look it up, right? So you wanna you wanna take your time with it and be strategic on who you're reaching out to. When you do get a hold of these people, right, who may be higher ups, ask about their particular experience. You can go online and learn about the company. You know, you can go to that role and ask about tasks, but maybe you can't find out work life balance. Maybe sometimes you can't figure out is this a role that's actually for me. Um, so be very specific and use your time wisely. And just, yeah, and just recognize that, you know, if you keep knocking on the door, doors will open. But once that door opens, be ready. I don't know how I'm going to follow all three of those amazing gems um, because those were fantastic. Um, <laughs> but I, I, in my story and how I got into this music industry, you know, I, I was kind of, there's always a piece of luck, right, that that you need and and. For me, I had a piece of luck that I had nothing to um, that I had nothing to do with. It was my mom's boss that met my new boss, and but the one thing that I remembered was once you get once you get put into that opportunity or that place or that space, you have to take full advantage of it. Um, and like you got like uh, Carmen said, you know, I did my homework on him and. It felt a little weird, you know, that I knew how the backstory of his, basically his whole life, but that was what I can tell that sparked him and he received what I was saying because it was like, you know, I didn't read the article from two years ago. I read the article from 15 years ago and that's like deep dive homework. And when, now that I'm on the kind of, sometimes on the receiving end of that, that is when I can really, I'm very interested in those, in those, you know, people that I'm talking to, because it's like, you guys actually took the time. Um, like you said, you're strategic. And that is always, you know, you have to have a map in this industry. Now, you don't know where the end goal of that map is on this journey, but there's ways to connect your career and move and transition, like you said, horizontally, laterally, it, like there's just ways to move in this industry. And once you, once you get going in the beginning, I'm gonna be honest, it's very nerve wracking. I'm a, I'm an extroverted introvert. I am a very quiet person, but because this is my passion, I can, you know, I can talk to this very easily and I can have conversations even when I don't want to. And, you know, that's something that you're going to have to learn and adapt. And you're going to have to put yourself out there. You're going to have to be vulnerable. You're going to have to, um, you know, for me, I like being behind the stage or behind the scenes. That's what I do. But when I come on panels like this, I'm, the person on camera and you know in the beginning it was very very uncomfortable but it is something that has helped me along my career to not only you know give back to communities but also to network and grow my career and get the bigger jobs and meet other people um so as scary as it is it's really not that bad you know it's 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 actually fun you know you get meeting new people it's just um Again, because I'm all about interaction, that's what I love, you know. I, I wanna hop in and say something on the heels of that that, that I think is, um, is important to the map and not knowing. I, sorry to talk about my son a lot. I'm a, I'm a proud Jewish mother and you're just gonna have to deal with it. But he started playing drums when he was three years old and, and you know, was good. Like he was a badass little drummer and played, played, played. But he did not have that thing of like, I will die if I'm not playing drums on stage. It's something he's good at. He jams with people. It's therapy for him. He goes out. But he did not have that gene. And I would imagine if you guys, <laughs> cheers for Jewish mothers, if you guys are at a school like Berkeley and pursuing a, a, a career and a life as a music creator, you either have that gene or you don't. And and check yourself. If you have that gene, you're in it for the long haul because nothing's going to take you away from it. By the same token, as an executive in the music business, the minute I realized that there was a music business and not just the songs that came out of my radio or my record player, because we didn't even have CDs back then, I'm old. Um, 
literally, I was my freshman year of college. I met my best friend the first day of college, I found out Thanksgiving of my freshman year, her uncle was the president of a record company. And I was like, wait, what's that? What is that? And it was like, light bulb can't be, which can't see. All of a sudden I saw it and I was like, oh my God, what do I have to do to be in the music business? What do I have to do to be in the, bi I thought music was free. You know, I'm like, 18 years old and thinking, oh, songs just come out on radio, or I go to Turtles Records and buy a, a 45, and I don't know who makes money. I wasn't even thinking about business. And the minute it hooked me, I knew, and nothing was going to stop me. So it's the same. I had that same gene about there's no other industry I'm going to be in. I'm not going to go be a banker or stockbroker or an insurance person or, you know, an entrepreneur even. I want to be around the music and the artists and the and the people who who power this business, and I never let go. And so I would I would say to, to students, check yourself. Do you have that thing? And if you have that thing, great, you're you're in for it. If you don't have that thing, stay open, stay open. You might need to Ross pivot. Um, but if it if it if it's got you, um, and one thing leads to another, that map. One of the th other thoughts I had is that all of the little inconsequential shit I did through college and, and right out of college where I was like, I know I want to be in the music business. Did and I was doing this and doing working in a box office and cutting carrots for, you know, dressing rooms at clubs in Washington, D.C., part of the hospitality team and being a runner for a promoter, you know, driving to pick up bands, dry cleaning and stuff. The low level stuff, being a floater at the William Morris Agency, going in and you know, hawking on the phone all day to, to do commercial casting and just wanting to be in the music business. But one thing led to another and somebody got my resume and saw that I had worked at this specific club, that I had worked at this specific agency. And I had, you know, my resume was fine. It was embellished. You know, what was I going to put? Carrot cutter at the Bayou, uh, you know, in Washington, D.C. It was like hospitality coordinator at the Bayou. And, um, but but the person who ended up kickstarting my entire career had worked at a different club in DC, had worked at a different agency. And she was like, wow, wow, check, check. I got the call, I got the job. And literally I've never looked back. I've never had to have a resume. I've gotten every single job from the job and I've built a real career and a real life. So just uh, putting that out there to those. I like could not agree more. And I think it's interesting, you know, uh, I'm, you know, we're all obviously still in the midst of our careers, but like looking back now and I'm like, huh, I didn't think that was going to come all the way around to what I'm doing now. And I look, I look at certain things that I did in the past when I was 14, I routed tours at my high school and figured and like emailed a manager of a big artist and got him to perform at my high school. And I wasn't, I was trying to be a journalist. I wanted to be a sports reporter or um, an international reporter. I was not trying to be in the music industry. And I look back now and I'm like, that is exactly the drive and the hunger and the like, I'm not gonna take no for an answer. I'm gonna figure it the hell out. And like, that's what you need, I think in this industry. And like, you know, we've talked about mental health. We've talked about all these things. I think it's important to know that the highs are really high and the lows are really freaking low and you know you kind of that toolbox jump in and kind of find the people that can like help you realize like no you love this keep going it's gonna be okay you know and and I do think that even though some people like you Allie were like I want to be in the music industry from day one there are people who start off differently and I think because I'm a radio host and run a business a lot of people told me to pick a lane. And it was like, stay in your lane, pick one, you can't do all of these things. And to me, I see that had I not left my job as a radio host back then, started a company and spent three years or four years or whatever it was working my company, I would not have gotten this Apple gig. And I would not have been as good of a host that I hope I am, you know? And it's like, that informs this. And I think that's a big part of this too, is you don't have to, I mean, you can pick a lane and, and, you know, pick something you love to do, but there are hundreds of different jobs that you can do within the music industry. And you could be at a record label and do 10 different things, or you can be at an agency and do a hundred different things. And it's like, 
figure out that you want to be in the music industry and then kind of dive in and, and, you know, keep those connections and, and all of that. So every, every answer was incredible. I think one of the things I want to, you know, after you network, or after you, you know, kind of figure out you want to be in the music industry, what are some tips that we can tell the students watching? Like, how do you pick that lane that you want to be in? Or how do you realize like, okay, I didn't know there was a job in this, you know, is it just asking questions? Is it doing a hundred different internships? Or what do you think is the best route for students to then kind of hone in on what they want to do in the music industry? I feel like it's, I mean, we, I, we go back, I'm going to go back to networking, but just reaching out to people who have already walked that path that you want to walk and, you know, asking and, and, and just receiving advice from them. You know, they may say something that you don't agree with or you don't see right now in your career that that's what the right or, right or wrong thing to do, but they have the experience. So just following, they're not following their footsteps, but take, you know, what they've gone through already so that you don't make the same mistakes. I had, I had a mentee call me um, for some tech advice. And after I gave him the solution and it worked, he said, man, you, you always know everything. And I was like, no, I, I, I don't know everything. Trust me, I, I, I don't. I've just been in your shoes and, and have done exactly what you're going through. So I can give you advice to make you, you know, not fall, not, you know, have those mistakes. Um, and after I made that comment to him, he, he like, I could tell he took a step back and was like, yeah, you're right. You know? And he said that he does the same thing to his other friends. And, um, I've also had people who don't receive the information well, and, 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 you know, I can tell that there's a disconnect and it's sad to, it's sad to, to see that, but, you know, again, it's your own journey, but sometimes it's nice to kind of just piggyback or take little pieces from other people's journeys to learn and, and again, create that map and how you move. And if you do it the right way, you'll be successful. I think it's good to be curious, right? To like, like you talked about, like you don't have to pick a lane. So it's like, be curious. What are you, what gets you excited? What are you asking questions about? And to Brandon's point, like find those people who are in that path right now ask them a lot of questions, be intentional about it, right? To Carmen's point, if it's someone who's like really senior in the role, you may not get an answer back. So find someone who's not a senior. What do they like? What do they don't like? How do they get there? What's the best part of, I mean, my favorite question is when someone says, what's your good day and what's your bad day? What's the best part of your job? And what's the bad part about your job? You got to ask that question. We all need to know that. <laughs> Cause like Anata said, it's the highs and the lows and you got to live through both. Um, and then be open to like, all right, I may jump into something and I may, may be in this position for however long, right? Whether that's a short time or a long term, but like glean everything you can from that position that you're in, whatever it is, if it's creative, if it's, you know, business, if it's cutting carrots, because that's going to propel you to the next step. Um, and you're, I mean, your map shouldn't look, I mean, I, I have been at the same company for a long time. So you may think my map is very linear, but I can tell you my growth in my company is like, and that's the most exciting part, right? I've been fortunate to be at a company that's allowed me to do that, right? I've, I've pivoted and moved and changed directions and have different responsibilities. Um, but yeah, I mean, God, I, I, uh, I live vicariously through students now who have such a like, wide open journey ahead of them. And I know it's so hard when you're in those shoes because you're thinking like, how am I going to plan my life out? Don't plan your life out because things are going to come to you that you don't even know they're going to come. There's jobs that don't exist right now that you guys are going to be doing that we won't even, we don't even know how to prepare you for them. I think that's really exciting. So that gets me excited because I, I want to prepare, be, be prepared for those new jobs because I think it's like, it's the future. I want to kind of pivot into, sorry, I keep using the word pivot, but I want to move into talking about diversity in the industry, because I know obviously it's diversify the stage and we've got someone who's in the touring industry and, you know, it's super important. We got a great question from Ellen asking about, you know, she gets asked a lot to recommend diverse hires, but a lot of times these databases don't evolve. And so what are some tangible ways for the future you know, the people that are watching right now to kind of, you know, 
help alleviate that issue. Is Ellen a student? I'm not sure. Ralph, do we know who Ellen is? I don't know. No, not, I, uh, she's not in my class. She's saying not a student. Um, this is this is the uh, this is the paramount question I think for our industry right now. Um, last May, June, when George Floyd was murdered, and uh, the world finally opened their eyes uh, in a different way, in a very intentional, proactive way, to creating a more equitable world and and dealing with the structural and system systemic. Uh, race issue that we have, particularly in this country, our industry, which was built uh, by a lot of white men, basically. And it's, um, you know, I know for women like me and Nada and Becky, who have been fighting on the gender front to get in the room, to be taken seriously, to have access and opportunity, um, we understand uh, but we can never understand what it's like to be at the intersection of um, of all of the challenges to try and break into an industry that is dominated by by white men. Um, we, I know Becky's company is as well. We are super focused as an industry on how to build more inclusive and diverse um, workforces. Um, but there's a pipeline problem. There is a pipeline problem, and so we have to be really intentional about it. So the databases are great. Um, they do need to be maintained. We do need to figure out how to support those and evangelize those. I don't have a magic wand um, remedy for that, but we need to start even earlier, right? We need to, Live Nation is definitely focused on this. I believe WME is as well. I believe a lot of companies are. Um, and as I say all the time to, to Noel, it's like, I'm not here to do performative shit. Like, let's get in, let's do the nitty gritty. How are we really creating transactional things that are making our, our pipeline stronger um, with people of color and with uh, historically excluded groups of people? And it's, it's not something that's gonna happen overnight, but if all of you as students can, and I don't know what the population of this, the student body is there, but again, I say to my son all the time, as a white man, you have to show leadership in this area. If you're doing something, you look around the room. How many women are included? How many people of color are included? How are you bringing them along? How are you stepping aside and creating opportunity for them? And it's, you know, it's going to be on all of us. I got a call from um, an agency last week who was looking to to hire for a position and the most qualified people for the position were a bunch of white men. And she was really at a stump. She said, you know, I want to put in a, you know, a more marginalized human in this position. I don't want to set somebody up to fail. They don't have the experience to do the job. So we had a really robust conversation and it was, what if you, and, and Becky, I would, I would encourage you to do this. I'm doing this in my, in my company. If we have to backfill a position or we're creating a new position, can we, commit to a budget that creates an apprenticeship, a real apprentice, a shadow program, a 12 month, I am paying person X, insert historically excluded person. Um, I am paying them to shadow the person who's filling this position. So I'm not setting this person up to fail. Um, but we have to be thinking of it that way because the database, yes, we need to figure out the database. and they're, and, and I do also want to say, and sorry, this is a tangent. As a woman who's trying to drive gender equity in this business, I say all the time, women don't need to be empowered. I don't need another empowerment lesson. We are empowered. We need access to the opportunity. We need somebody to let us get in there. So, you know, it's, it's a complicated thing, you know. Who, who has the experience and the skill set to step into these jobs and how do we create that for them? Um, and so it's a long-winded uh, answer, but I think it's a very important question that Ellen asked. And I think um, I would, as, as Brandon was like centering mental health and it's super important, I, I, I would center how do we all do better um, 
in creating a more inclusive and diverse workplace, thinking outside the box. Sorry. No, I, 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 for myself, have, um, along with my mental health, I've been thinking about that a lot. And, you know, what's the, what's the future of, in my case, the touring industry? Um, like Ali said, you know, older white dudes are, you know, the majority of, of other front of house sound engineers that I know. Um, and for me, it's, you know, I, I started when I was 22 and I was the young got on the crew and I didn't really see many of me to be honest that's just not what I saw uh, in college I didn't see much of me either um, but now that I have you know whatever platform that I've been given um, I'm always looking for the future I mean I'm or, or looking for the future you know of this industry and um the client that I just picked up, um, I, I could just share, I just landed Kendrick Lamar. Um, and I, I told management, you know, I want a very diverse audio crew. And this, and, and this tour doesn't start. So, you know, don't ask me for tickets or anything yet. But um, I'm looking that far ahead and, and seeing who's available. And, you know, I basically put what I'm saying is my audio Avengers. I have um, a black woman that's my assistant. I have um, a, uh, a gay black female that's flying PA, um, an Asian, uh, or I'm sorry, he's Korean, uh, another assistant. And it's like, what I told them was, you know, as on tour, we're a family. So audio, like we eat together, we do everything together. I said, you know, when you walk into catering and you see that at the table, and that's your team audio for an artist, that's a, that's a ground shake, you know what I mean? And um, I was telling someone else about it and he said, I have chills from that because you just don't see that. You know, I'm, I'm used to being one of two black crew members. I mean, you know, and, I, and I'm, I've worked for, for a lot of hip hop and African-American artists and I'm one of two. It just doesn't make sense, but that's just what the industry we are in. And, you know, that's what we're dealing with now, but that's why we're shaping the future. Um, you know, Martin Luther King, it didn't get perfect for him then. It's still not perfect now. So we're still transitioning. And that's the same thing in, the, in our music industry, especially in the live touring side. And I have faith that we will get there one day, you know. I think that's so, both what Ali and Brandon said are like such perfect examples because it is, it goes back about the access. I mean, Ali, you said it earlier, you can't be what you can't see. And so there's a lot of these positions that people don't even know, like the, the reason there's a pipeline problem is because there's a lot of people that didn't even know they could, they could even do these jobs, one, the awareness, right? Two, then how do you get to do those jobs, right? So at least, I mean, there's a microscope and there's conversations about all of this. So that's the good sign. There's a lot of work to do. I mean, diversify the stage. What an amazing platform. And the announcement of that scholarship program, like all of these things are huge steps in the right direction. But, um, but to Ali's point and Brandon's point, and I know Carmen and Nada and all of us, like it's on us to keep, to keep waving the flag, talking about this, making sure we're making the right steps, doing something within whatever our power may be. Right. And I can save this for the ACMs because I'm part of the ACMs. Like we're talking about mentorship programs and we're talking about, you know, uh, using some people as interns at the ACMs that are from HBCUs and, you know, all the, all those types of conversations are happening. So um, that's, it doesn't solve your question, Ellen, but I think those are, we are, we recognize it's a problem and trying to figure out how to keep making it better and eventually have a better solve going forward. Um. That was an incredible answer from everyone. And unfortunately we're like already an hour in, which is crazy. I feel like we could talk about this for another hour, um, but I wanted to thank everyone who is watching, Brandon, Carmen, Ali, Becky, Ralph. Um, I just think that this, these are the conversations we need to be having. And as people who um, are diverse in lots of ways and you know, trying to make these changes in our industry and the people, the students that are watching and, and need that opportunity. I think these are the kinds of things that we should continue to do. Um, 
I think you can reach out to any of us uh, through Ralph, but if anyone has any other additional questions, please do that. And then Ralph, um, yeah, I think we're done, unfortunately. Wow, you know, that, that I, was, I was blown away. And, you know, whenever speakers, uh, I present speakers to my students, sometimes it's over their heads or they're speaking down to them. But this is practical, really practical advice from some amazing leaders in, in the business. Listen, we're, we're all busy people. So thank you so much for the time everybody put into this. You know, Noel and the Diversify the Stage folks, it's amazing how much work they put into it. And the Academy of Country Music, what a great partner. The fact that we got Korg to sponsor this program and a future scholarship with Diversify the Stage is great news. Um, this is going to benefit my students. I'm thankful for everybody involved. Um, so Nada, you, you're amazing. Uh, the panelists blew me away. Diversify the Stage, Academy of Country Music and Korg. Uh, from here at Berkeley College of Music, thank you so much uh, for everybody involved in this. And we should do it again. We will do it again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nada. I think she's already off. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really great. Thank you.